Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K-E-S-H-W-A-N-I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2022. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Always make sure that this book is in front of you when you're working with me. Today we'll solve some problems that you will find on page number 141. But before we get to before we get to page 141, in the last video on the previous page on page 140, there was a problem, problem number 180, that we left behind. I skipped it because it involved too much writing on the blackboard and I didn't want to take up too much time in the video. So we are going to do it today. Here's number 80. Here's problem number 80 from the previous page, page 140. We are told that an exam was given and the students scores are here, x1, x2, x3, these are reading, up to xn. We are further told that the standard deviation of those scores is 20. And now what the teacher did was, she took each score, we're going to take each score and we're going to take 80% of it. We're going to multiply by 0.8 each score, we're going to take 80% of each score and we're going to add 20 to it. And that's going to give us these new scores. So first score was x1, it becomes 0.8 x1 plus 20, the next one is 0.2 x 0.8 x2 plus 20, so on and so forth until 0.8 xn plus 20. The question simply is, when we do this adjustment to the score, what happens to the standard deviation? Does the standard deviation remain the same or does it change? What's the new standard deviation? Let's see what's going on. Let's see what we can do. So the original mean, the original mean, we're going to call it m. If the original mean is m, if you have a set of, set of uh, numbers and if you add 15 to each score, the original mean is going to be 50 and the new mean is going to be 15 more than the old one. If you take each score and multiply it by half, the new mean is going to be half as much. So here, original mean was m, which means the new mean is simply going to be 0.8 times m plus 20. And before we can figure out what the new standard deviation is, the very first thing we need to do is figure out this, figure out the deviation of each score from the mean. Here's the new deviation. The new deviation is simply going to be the new score, which is 0.8 x1 plus 20 minus the new mean, which is this right here, 0.8m, 0.8m plus 20. As you can see, when we open the parentheses, the 20s drop out, 0.8x1 plus 20 and the minus 20 here, when we open the parentheses, drop out, and what we end up here is 0.8x1 minus 0.8m, which boils down to 0.8x1 minus m. Now, x1 minus m, as you can clearly see, is the old deviation of the observation from the mean. So it's essentially 0.8 times the old deviation. Therefore, the new standard deviation is simply going to be each of the deviation from the mean, which is 0.8 x1 minus m squared plus 0.8 x2 minus m, which is the old mean, squared, and so on and so forth. As you can see, this 0.8 appears in everywhere, and it is being squared every time. Every time it's being squared, and it's under the square root sign. So when we take it out common, we simply have 0.8 outside because 0.8 squared, when we take a square root, becomes 0.8. So it's just 0.8 times this guy, 0.8 times x1 minus m squared plus x2 minus m squared, all the way up to 0.xn, uh, all the way to xn minus m squared. As you can see, this guy divided by n, when we take the square root of it, is the old standard deviation. So essentially we end up here is 0.8 times the old standard deviation, old standard deviation we were told is 20, therefore the new standard deviation of what we're looking for here, the new standard deviation is simply 0.8 times 20, hence giving us the answer of 16, which is answer choice B. There is not much in it, but as I said before, it involves a lot of writing and I didn't want to do that in the middle of the video. Let's do the next one, shall we? Having said that, in the next problem, we also are going to have a lot of writing and I have no choice but to actually do all the writing. I'm going to raise the top part. Next question is also kind of involved, which is number very first problem that you see on page number 141, number 186. Stay with me here because here we have to keep track of a lot of things. We are told that two classes are taught. Two classes are taught at 32 schools. 
If two classes are taught at 32 schools, that tells us that in itself tells us that 64 courses are taught. We have a total of 64 courses are taught by, by 37 teachers. We are told that each teacher, this is very important, each teacher, each taught at least at least one course but no more than three so one more time we have 37 teachers that are employed in these two schools we have to teach 64 courses each teacher is going to teach at least one course but no more than three here's the question Question is if the number of teachers who taught three courses is n is n n represents the number of teachers who are going to teach three courses. Any any given teacher that you pick at random out of this 37 teachers, any given teacher that you pick, we know that teacher must have taught at least one course or two course or three courses, but no more than three courses. If n represents the number of teachers who taught three courses exactly, then the question is what is the least and greatest possible values of n? As you know already, in questions like this, when, they, when the question like this appears in the exam, the important part is, is to remain calm, or digest everything, take your time, which is why I'm not going too fast here. What is the greatest and the least possible value of M? So let's begin. Let's, let's begin our showdown. Before we do any, anything at all, here's what we have. We have number of teachers who taught, who taught either one course two course or three courses. This is given to us. We are told that that's n. The number of teachers who taught only one course, we're going to give it a name. Let's call it x. And the number of teachers who taught two courses, we're going to call it y. So now we have an equation here. So therefore the total number of courses, number of courses, must be 1 times x, because we have x number of x number of teachers who taught one course, we have y number of teachers who taught two courses, and we have n number of teachers who taught three courses. And these has to be the total number of courses that are taught. And that we know is 64. And if x represents, if x represents the number of teachers, oh we can do it right here. If x represents, we don't have to, I don't want to rewrite it. If x represents the number of teachers who taught exactly one course and y represents the number of teachers who taught exactly two courses and n represents the number of teachers who taught exactly three courses, then these three quantities x plus y plus n represents the number of teachers. And that we know is 37. We have 37 teachers that are employed. There we go. Let's see where we go with it, okay? Let's, let's, let's continue. We're going to subtract this equation from that from top top equation and see what it takes us. x minus x is going to drop out. y minus 2y is going to give us negative y. n minus 3n is going to give us negative 2n. And that has to equal 37 minus 64. 64, 64 minus 34 would have been 30. We're not subtracting 34, we're subtracting 37. So 30 should be 27. Let's put it in a positive way. So y plus 2n equals 27. Now what we are interested in is this guy, n. So when we solve this equation for n, bring y to the other side, divide by 2, and we end up with 27 minus y, 27 minus y, over 2. This is, this is what we have to work with. This is what we have to work with. Now we can figure out the least possible value and the greatest possible value of n. Let's do it on the top.
let's first look at the least. Let's first look at the least possible value. And then we'll look at the greatest possible value. So n, n is this guy right here. n equals 27 minus y over 2. Now y represents the number of teachers who taught two courses. It is quite possible there is no teacher who taught two courses. There is nobody who taught two courses. Why not? It is possible. However, when we divide 27 by 2, we'll end up with 13 and a half. And since n and x and y, since x, since x, n, y and n represent the number of teachers, they have to be integers, they have to be whole numbers. We cannot have 13 and a half teachers teaching three courses. Therefore, y, the smallest value of y can... Oh, actually, the way I'm doing it here, we're looking at the greatest value. Because I'm making this as small as possible, we're looking at the greatest value. And since the smallest value of y that we can have is 1, it has to be 1. There has to be at least one teacher. In other words, there has to be at least one teacher who taught two courses. Why? Because 27 minus 1 is going to give us 16, uh, 26, 26 divided by 2 is 13. So that's the largest possible value. Just because it has to be integers. That's the largest possible value, 13. Let's, look at, let's quickly look at the answer choices. There you go. If you look at the answer choices, we're basically done. Only, if you look at the answer choices, and of course that depends on how much faith you have in your work, assuming that you have complete faith in your work, the largest possible value for n is 13, you can immediately cross out all the answer choices, the answer has to be A. But let's continue. Let's look at the least one. n is equal to, I'm going to pick up speed now. n is equal to 27 minus y over 2. Maybe there are 27 teachers out of the out of the 34 teachers that we had, or 37 teachers rather, out of 37 teachers, why not? It is quite possible that of those 37 teachers, 27 of them to, to, taught two courses. If that's the case, 27 minus 27 will be 0 and n will be 0. And we can quickly verify it. We can quickly verify it if you like. Not something that you will do in the real exam, but we can do it here. Just quickly verify it. So here, we are pretending, we are here the n, n works out to be 13, we are working y is equal to 1, and therefore x must be 13 plus 1 is 14, and since it's 34, total number of teachers is 34, uh, 37 rather, 37 minus 24, or rather 14, should give us 23. And if you do that, n represents the number of teachers who so, saw so 3 courses, so 3 courses times 13, 2 courses times 1, and 23 courses times x represents 1 course times 23. And if our work is correct, this should add up to the total number of courses that were taught in the class, uh, in the school, and that works out to be, that should work out to be, the number of courses that were taught, which is 64. So that's 39 plus 2 plus 46. Plus 7, 7 plus 9 is 6. Uh, sorry, 8, 8 plus 8 is 16, plus 9 is 17, 7, carry 1. And I'm getting 23, 23, 23, 2, and 13 times 9 is. I don't know where I'm getting this thing. I have the 39, I have the 2, I don't know where 46 came from, it's times 1. Anyway, I'm going to stop right here. You can do it yourself and you'll see that it works out to be exactly 64. And similarly, you can verify there. Put the n equal to 1. If n is equal to 1, uh, sorry, n is equal to 0, y is equal to 27, which means x must be, uh, x must be 10. And you can verify it yourself. You see, 10 times 1 is uh, 1. 27 times 2 is 2, because y represents the number of teachers who took two courses. So we get 54 plus 10 is 64. That was number 180, 186 rather. That, is, that was it. The rest are going to go very quickly. 
The next problem is actually very straightforward. We have, we have numbers, we are told n, n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 4, and n plus 8. And n plus 8. Now, what we are looking for is the question is mean, the mean of these quantities is how much greater than the median. That's what we're looking for. Well, the median is very easy because we have 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This is the median. So that guy is very easy. Let's quickly figure out the mean. So we just add up all of these quantities. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We get 5 n. And 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 plus 4 is 7. 7 plus 8 is 15. There we go. So therefore the mean is simply going to be this quantity divided by 5 because there are 5 observations. You have to divide that by 5 because I have equal sign there. So if you divide by 5, 5 drops out and we end up with n. 15 divided by 5 is 3. There you go. That's all it is. And when you subtract the 2, n drops out. It's just 3 minus, 3 minus 2 which is 1. So the difference between the mean and the median is only 1. 188. As you can see, some are quite straightforward and some are not, obviously. 188, it's a geometry problem. We have a rectangular box here. We are given this rectangular box and we are told that the volume of this box is x cubic feet. We are told that the length, the width, and the height are in the ratio of 3 to 2 to 2. 3 to 2 to 2. The question simply is, what is the height? What is the height of this guy here? The height is how much? So, since they are in a ratio of 3 to 2 to 2, the height is, height we are told is 2 parts, so width is 2 parts, the length is 2 parts, I'm just going to call this length. So let's call this 3a, this is 2a, this is 2a, and we're going to find out how much is that height in terms of x. Let's see what we can do. Volume we know, volume we know is x cubic feet. But we also know the volume has to be 3a plus 2a plus 2a, 2a, 2 plus two times 2 is 4, 4 times 3 is 12. So the volume is equal to 12a cube, we know has to be equal to x. All we have to do is solve for a, and when we solve for a, we get x over 12, the cube root of it. We are not interested in a, a does not represent the height, the height is 2a. So you just multiply by 2. And there is your height. That's all it is. It is that quantity times 2. Now the problem here is that, the problem here is that if you stop right here, and if you look at the answer choices, none of the answer choices match. That's your q, that's our q that we need to cook it a little bit more. It's not cooked, it's still raw. The answer choices do not match. What they have done, listen carefully, what they have done, they have brought this 2 under the cube root sign. How do you bring the 2 under the cube root sign? By converting this 2 into an 8, because the cube root of 8 is 2. So instead of writing it as a 2, we'll have to write this as cube root of 8. And now we can put them together. This is a cube root, this is a cube root. If you put them together, this is 8 times x. 8 times x over 12 and we take a cube root of this guy. You see? And you just simplify it. Divide top and bottom by 4, this becomes 2 and this becomes 3 and we end up with cube root of 2x over 3. And this is how, this is how the answer choice appears in the book, in the exam rather. Do you understand? If you stop right here, if you stop right here, we are in trouble. This was a 2. And if you look, but once you start looking at the answer choices, once we start looking at the answer choices, we'll see that it's not going anywhere. That's when you know that you need to do something more with it. That's the answer. 189. One eighty nine. We are told that the current ratio of 
a student to teacher is 30 to 1. We further told, we further told that if, if the number of students goes up by 50 and the number of teachers goes up by 5, right now the ratio of students to teacher is 30 to 1. But if we end up having 50 more students and 5 more teachers, in that case we are told that the new ratio is 25 to 1. So now the new ratio, which is going to be the students to teacher, before we had S students, the number of students has gone up by 50, so we have S plus 50. And before we had one teacher for every, every 30 students, now we have, oh, we, before we had T teachers, it has gone up by 5, so it's going to be T plus 5. And now this ratio we are told is 25 to 1. That's all. Two very simple equations. The question now is what is t? We have two very simple equations, two unknown. Of course, we can solve for either, either the number of students or number of teachers. They're looking for number of teachers. So we can continue here actually. We can, why don't we continue here? Cross multiply here. This is just one. So s, s is equal to t times 30. This equation tells us that number of students has to be 30 times teacher. Of course, number of students has to be 30 times teacher because each teacher teaches 30 students. What? Well, each teacher does not teach 30 students, but the rest that's the ratio, on average, I should say. So why don't we substitute this S, this S, 30T, in here and see where it takes us. So S becomes 30T plus 50 over T plus 5, and that has to equal 25 to 1. We're going to continue this guy right here. If you cross multiply, this is just times 1, it doesn't do anything, it's 30t plus 50. And that has to equal 25 times t plus 5. 25 times t plus 5 is simply 25t plus 125. And here we have 30t plus 50. Bring 25t here. We end up with 5t equals 125 minus 50, which is 75. Divide both sides by 5. And we end up with 15. Which means that to start out with, to begin with, we must have had 15 teachers. And now we have 20 teachers. Number 190. Number 190 says that the smallest integer, smallest integer n has to be such that this quantity 25 raised to n has to be greater than 15 raised to 12. The question is what is the possible value of n among the answer choices 190? Uh, what is this, rather, what is the smallest? Smallest integer for which this is true. We're looking for smallest possible value. Well, the first thing we need to do is make the base is the same, so we can get anywhere. Let's write out 25 as 5 squared n. 5, 5 squared n is simply 5 raised to 2n, and we told that this has to be greater than 5 raised to 12. Now, since the bases are the same, in order for this quantity to be greater than this quantity, that this power has to be greater than that power, which implies that 2n has to be greater than 12, which in turn implies that n must be whatever it is, has to be less greater than 6. As long as n is greater than 6, it will do the job. And therefore, the smallest value of n that we can have that is greater than 6 is 7. Among the answer choices, 7 is the smallest one that they, that they have given. And that's answer choice B. 191. In 191, we are told that we have a group of people. Men and women. We are told that 60% of them are women. 
which means 40% must be men. Do you understand? We are told that of the number of women that we have, of these women, 40% of women are lawyers. And therefore, the remaining must be non-lawyers, not 40%, but rather 45%, which means this must be 55%. And the question is this, if you were to pick one person at random, if one person is picked at random, one is selected at random, the question is, what are the odds that the person selected is a woman lawyer. What are the odds that in such a scenario, if we were to pick one person at random, that that person happens to be not only a female, but she also happens to be a lawyer? Let's see what we can do. Again, the simplest, easiest way to tackle these kind of problems is to make up a number. And of course, the easiest, easiest number to work with is 100. So we're going to pretend, we're simply going to pretend that we have 100 people. If we have 100 people, which means 40 people must be men and 60 must be women. Of those 60, 45% are female. Of those 60, 45% are female. So we have to figure out 45%, 45 over 100 of 60. Zero drops out. Let's see what else we can do. Divide by multiply, divide by five. We end up with nine, and we end up with two. Two goes away, and there, this becomes there. You go twenty-seven. There are twenty-seven. There are twenty-seven women in this group who happens to be lawyer, and therefore, if you were to pick one person at random out of this one hundred people, since there are twenty-seven people out of this one hundred who happen to be both female and a lawyer, the odds are twenty-seven out of hundred. 27%. The odds are 27% that the person that you picked is a female lawyer. Number 192. In 192, we are told that each year the number goes up by 25%. Each year the number goes up by 25% for four years. We are told that at the end of four years, we have 6,250. It makes absolutely no difference what it is that is growing by one quarter each, each, each year. It makes no difference. It's a farmer and it's a tree. So each year the number of trees that he has on his farm goes up by 25 percent and that and that trend continues for four years at the end of four years he counts the tree and he finds out that he has 6,250 trees the question is how many trees did he start out with that's all it is so let's do it together shall we so here is our timeline this is the starting point year zero then we have first year second year third year and four year year zero here we're going to start with X. We have X number of trees to start out with and because it's growing by 25% each year, each year, each year it goes by 25%. If you had X, the next year is going to be 1.2 times X. 1.25 rather. 1.25 times X. The following year we're going to have 25% more of this, which means we're going to have 1.25 squared times x and so forth because it is because you see at the end of second year at the end of second year we have 25 percent more than this quantity which is 1.25 times 1.25 x which is 1.25 squared x next year it's going to be 1.25 cubed x and finally we have 1.25 raised to 4 x now the problem here is that most of the time when I'm dealing with my client, what I find is that sometimes the creativity lake lacks. If you leave it like this, the way it is in the ugly form, it becomes very tedious to deal with it. 
Write it in fraction. Write it in fraction so that your calculation goes faster. You can write it in fraction. If this is x, 1.25x is simply 5 over 4. This is 5 over 4 squared. This is 5 over 4 cubed. And this is 5 over 4 to the 4. And that quantity has to equal 6,250. There we go. All we have to do is solve that equation and we are done. So let's do this one top. I'm going to raise all of this thing. We have the equation. That's what we're going to work on. I need the room, so I have to raise all of this thing. We're going to erase the first two years. So we have 5 over 4 raised to 4 times x has to equal 6250 which implies which implies that x has to equal 6250 6250 over 5 over 4 to the fourth let's continue which in turn means this has to be 6,250 6,250, you see the numbers are there for a reason you should be able to recognize that it's, 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 it's for a reason that it is 6,250 and not 7,250 or 6,500 do you recognize it? 6,250 is actually 625 which is a perfect square which we're going to use in our calculation in a second times 10 and when we flip this thing it becomes 4 raised to 4 over 5 raised to 4. Are you with me? 4 raised to 4, and here we have 625. 625 is, five, is 25 squared. Or oh, rather, oh, it is 25. Oh, it goes away. What do you know? It's actually, not, it's actually better than what I thought. Look, 625. 625 is 25 squared, which is the same as 5 raised to 4. Oh, it goes away. But well, that makes our life very easy. We just have to figure out 4 is to 4 and that's all. And 4 is to 4, I'm going to erase this thing. 4 is to 4, don't look at, don't think of this as a 4 is to 4, just 10 times, 10 times 4 is to 4, which is simply 4 squared times 4 squared. And you should know your perfect squares, you should know, you should know your perfect squares up to, up to, up to 20. And if you know your perfect square, you should know that 16 times 16 is 256. 256 times 10, 256 times 10, there you go. You must have started out our story with, six, with 2,560 trees and the number of trees grew by 25% each year and it did so for four years hence giving us at the end 6,250 trees that was the very last problem on this page I think I'm going to stop right here I'm not going to start a new page let's stop right here we'll meet again tomorrow we'll pick up our story where we left off in the meantime if you wish to get hold of me if you would like to work with me if you would like to hire me to get you ready for the exam you can, do, you can get hold of me by sending me an email. Just go to my website at kashwaniprep.com. From there you can send me an email. Or if you wish to tell me a little bit more about yourself, there is a form there you can fill out. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. And we'll talk some more. Alright? Bye now.